Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So when I was eight years old, I was sitting in my parents' living room. I was watching TV. I was sitting on the couch. My show was over, and I turned off the TV, and I kind of slid off the couch like sometimes lazy kids do to get up and go do what was next, and the cushion that I was sitting on fell off and flipped over. So I went to go pick up the cushion and put it back on the couch, and I saw this tag. Ever seen one of these tags before? Right? Do we have a picture of the tag up there? There it is. Right? Under penalty of law, this tag is not to be removed except by the consumer. Now, in my eight-year-old mind, I did not have the word consumer in my vocabulary. So my belief was, like, if you take off that tag, you are in serious legal trouble. And I had seen that tag before and always had wondered, like, why? Why is it illegal that you can't, like, if you move that tag, what, what's the deal with that? So I'm staring at this tag. I'm like, what is that? And just curious. And so I start to, like, pull at it a little bit, <laughs> like, kind of remove a stitch or two. And like, I'm expecting something to happen at some moment. Like somebody's going to swoop in and be like, gotcha, you know. And I'm still playing with it. And then I get about halfway through and I'm like, all right. Like maybe I'm still safe because it's still attached. But what happens if I pull it all the way off? So I took a deep breath. I'm like, we're about to find out. And I just rip right away. And this wave of guilt and fear comes over me. Like, I'm, I'm certain that there is sensors attached to the tag that run through the couch, that go to the phone line and send a message to the police. I'm terrified that blue and red flashing lights are going to circle our house. I'm just like, what have I done? And so I run upstairs, and because my mom's in her room, holding this tag in my hand, and I just break down crying. Like, I did it. I knew I didn't do it, but I did it, and I'm so sorry. What is happening? Like, just terrified that the police are going to come and take me away. So my mom brings me over. She explains what a consumer means and like, you're going to be fine and it's okay. But there's something about that word don't, right? There's something about those words do not that provoke in us sometimes a desire to do the thing we're not supposed to do, right? If you've ever been in a place where like, don't cross that line. You're like, well, what happens if I cross that line? Like, what are you going to do if I cross that line, right? Now, looking at that tag, if the words, you know, don't, like, weren't on that tag, I probably would have just picked it up and put it back on the couch and moved on my way. But that prohibition created curiosity in me. What happens if I do? You, You could maybe say it this way, that there's something about a prohibition that impacts your disposition and can lead you to transgression, right? There's something about a prohibition, a command, that can impact your disposition, your posture, your engagement, and lead you to transgression. Earlier this winter, we were at Center Street Park. They're getting the ice ready for the ice rinks, and they have this big sign, don't go on the ice. We're at the park with my kids, and I tell them as we're walking towards the ice rink to take a look, like, hey guys, the sign says, don't go on the ice. I turn away for a second to talk to somebody over here. I turn back, and one of my kids is like climbing over the wall to get on the ice. I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, I just wanted to see what it felt like. I'm like, well, it says don't get on the ice. There's something about a prohibition that can impact our disposition and lead us to transgression. But the question is why? Why does that happen? Like, how does that work? What does that say about us? And what does that say about the law? And in our context, the biblical law. Like, how are we supposed to make sense of the biblical law and what that does in us when it comes to living in a way that honors God? Well, our passage today in Romans 7 starts to get at this reality. And this is what Paul says as we start Chapter 7, verse 7. Paul says, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not, he says. Now we're in this section of Romans where Paul is circling around three ideas, three topics. Those three things are sin, 
law and grace. And as Christians, it's not uncommon for us to conclude that law is bad and grace is good, right? Because the law doesn't have power to save us. Only grace can save us. We are saved by grace through faith, not the law. So maybe the law actually isn't all that good, but grace is good. And Paul is anticipating that at this point in the letter, from the recipients, there might be people concluding that the law is bad. And in part, it's because Paul has said certain things, and he knows this. He's said certain things about the law that could be perceived in a negative way. Like chapter 4, verse 15. He says, the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. So if the law never existed... Maybe sin never would have existed. And it was God who gave the law. So maybe God is the one who's responsible for sin, right? Chapter 5, verse 20. The law was brought in so that trespass might increase. So maybe the increase of sin in our world is actually as a result of the law. And again, God gave the law. So maybe this is all on him. Chapter 7, verse 5, that our sinful passions were aroused by the law. We'll see in verse 13 of this chapter that the law brings death. So if the law brings wrath, it increases sin, and those who live under the law are held captive by the law, and it ultimately leads to death. Maybe the law is not that good of a thing. Now, Paul is thinking some people might be drawing that conclusion at this point in the letter, that the law is sinful and responsible for sin. I mean, go back to the couch tag story. If it didn't say, don't remove, I probably would have just put the couch, put the cushion back on the couch and been about my way, right? Because a prohibition can impact our disposition and lead us to transgression. So maybe the law is bad. Maybe it's the law's fault. But there are other biblical writers who speak about the law in a very different way, who speak about the law in a wonderful way, who who speak about the law saying, oh, it's, it's sweeter than honey to my lips. It's more precious than anything else in the world. Psalm 119, it's the longest chapter in the Bible. It is 170 some verses all about the law. And David repeatedly says how wonderful the law is. Over and over and over, the law is great. The law is good. The the, the law brings life. It revives my soul. But he says in verse 14 of Psalm 119, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I don't know if you've ever watched uh, the Antique Roadshow, but sometimes it's fun to watch moments where people bring what they think is just some random piece of junk from their house, and it's incredibly valuable. Like this picture here is of an interview between a woman who had this painting who was painted by, it was painted by uh, H.F. Farney in 1892, and her grandmother owned this painting. And when her grandmother passed, it was just something that the family was going to get rid of and ended up saying, hey, do you want this painting? And at one point in time, as the grandmother was kind of declining, her house was appraised and it got appraised. The painting got appraised along with everything in the house. And it got appraised for $200 at one point in time, $250 at another point in time. So she brings it to the antique road show and she's sitting with an art expert and she explains a few things. The art expert hears everything that she has to say, and then eventually gives some comment on the painting and the painter and the time period and all these things. And she says, if we were to put this up for auction today, we would put it up for somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars And the lady who owns this painting just starts to break down and cry. She's like, oh, she's like, I'm speechless. Tears are streaming down my face. She's like, I guess I shouldn't hang it up. I guess I should keep it away from my dog. She's just overjoyed at the value of this piece of art. And David is saying the same way that one rejoices in the value of riches and the value of an expensive piece of art, we rejoice in the law. The law is priceless. So for those of us who have this perception that the law is bad, the question is, how did we get there with that perception? When the biblical writers seem to say that the law is good because the law is an extension 
of who God is and the character of God. And I think in order to evaluate the merit of the law, you first have to understand the purpose of the law. Like, why did God give the law to begin with? Now, you have to, at one level, back up to the moment when the law was given to understand why God gave it. And the law was given, right, in the book of Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the Old Testament law. Over 600 different laws in the Old Testament. And God gives Israel the law after they've been redeemed from slavery in Egypt. They lived in Egypt for over 400 years under the oppressive rule of Pharaoh. Their understanding of the world for those 400 years is that the Israelites make bricks for Pharaoh. The Israelites are tasked with building Pharaoh's empire. And often we think that the law is basically a legal code of right and wrong, do's and don'ts. And people who follow the law are good people, and people who break the law are bad people. But I would say that the law is way more comprehensive than just a a list of restrictions. Because in the law, you have health, hygiene, and diet laws, You have religious laws that kind of give guidance on how to practice one's faith and religious rhythms, rituals, how to atone for sin through the sacrificial system. And then you have communal laws, what it means to live in community and be a good neighbor. And I would say in part, what God is doing with the law in Exodus when he gives it to the Israelites is he's rehabilitating them with the law. Meaning their understanding of self in Egypt, was that they were nothing more than brickmakers for Pharaoh. That was their understanding of who they were, their identity as an enslaved people. We make bricks for Pharaoh. And then God brings them out of Egypt. He redeems them. He brings them into the wilderness, and he says, no, 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 no. You are my special possession. So he's reframing their understanding of themselves, and he's saying, here's how you are called to live as my special possession called by me to be a light to the world. And I think that's a helpful perception because sometimes we live with the misperception that the reason God gives laws is to restrict our freedom and he doesn't want to have us, he doesn't want us to have a good time, right? He's just this kind of like grumpy old guy and he's just trying to restrict our fun and limit us. But I would say God is doing something different. Now, the the law was intended to be temporary, in that Jesus comes to fulfill the law, so therefore we are no longer under the law. And the law for the Israelites was very helpful in that moment, but we live in a very different social context and situation than the Israelites did, so it raises the question, if that's what the law was doing for the Israelites, and if there are still commands and directives in the New Testament, like how are we supposed to understand what the law does for us who live in a very different situation than the Israelites did in the book of Exodus. And Paul goes on to give two other purposes for why the law was given. This is what he says in verse 7 again. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. Essentially what he's saying is that the law defines sin for us. The law starts to name sin for what it is. And this is a wildly applicable feature of the law for us because our cultural context doesn't think in terms of sin. Meaning sin isn't a category by which most people view their life today. Right? It's not as though there's something broken and wrong with the world and sin tells us what that is. Sin is probably this ancient reality, this ancient category, and we are modern people who have progressed beyond the notion of sin, and so we don't have to worry about sin. We can leave it behind. Nor would I say is our culture ultimately looking for some higher power to give them wisdom and guidance and meaning for our lives, because the the ultimate virtue of our culture is be true to yourself. Be true to yourself, be who you are, and be confident in and authentic in who you are. And when we live in that mindset, we lose sight of the reality of the world's brokenness. I mean, I think people in our culture would be able to say, like, yeah, the world's broken. There's things that are not right in the world. But when we live with our virtue being be true to ourself, 
it distances us from the responsibility that maybe I have also contributed to the breakdown of this world. Like maybe I have culpability in the reason why the world is broken the way that it is, and ultimately, I need somebody to help me fix it. Our world is distancing themselves from that reality because the virtue of our world is just be true to who you are. I'm taking care of myself, and I don't have to worry about it for anybody else. And so without the law defining sin, our virtuous pursuits become self-centered. And this mindset can actually easily infiltrate its way into the church. Uh, my kids have recently watched this Netflix movie called A Week Away. And when I heard about it, I was like, oh, that's a really interesting concept of a movie. It's about a troubled teen, who's the guy in the middle, who goes to a Christian summer camp for the week and falls in love with the camp director's daughter. And it's all about, you know, like the, the camp romance, the summer fling or whatever of being at camp. And it's kind of like a fun, cute movie. And it's a musical. And they call on all of these songs, Christian songs, from the 90s. So like Stephen Curtis Chapman, Audio Adrenaline. And when I found that, I was like, oh, that's got to be interesting. So they watch the movie. It's got this great catchy soundtrack. They're singing the songs all the time. The songs are always going in our house. And there's one song where in this scene, you have these two kids, the kid on the green, in the green shirt on the right side, and the girl wearing the overalls kind of in the middle. They like each other. They got this camp crush going on. But each one is afraid to tell the other or talk to the other because they think, oh, there's no way that this individual would like me back. And so this song is basically a conversation between the, these two guys, and the one guy is coaching what's supposed to be the geeky, nerdy guy, just go talk to her. And the other girls, uh, one girl is supposed to be like coaching and encouraging the other girl to go talk to the guy. And some of the lyrics of the song, I think, capture this mindset of just be true to yourself. Right? And this is a movie that's framing a Christian narrative, too. The, the song begins with one kid saying, the geeky kid saying, I don't even know what I would say if I wanted to. I'm not exactly what the kids these days are calling you, are calling cool. And then the friend responds, don't overthink it, man. Just do you. Right? So there it is. It's that, that subtle mindset of like, just do you. Authentic, authenticity is the highest virtue. And then it goes back, again, chorus, a couple more lyrics, back to the two guys. And he says, the only way you could go wrong is if you doubt yourself. Confidence is everything, no need to be someone else. So essentially what this movie is doing is it's framing the problem of humanity. It's like we just need more confidence. Like if we just had more self-confidence and if we were true to ourselves, and we didn't care what other people thought about us, everything in this world would be fine. Except that, like that worldview, like doesn't address the reality of the brokenness we're all living in. It only is a self-centered, me-centered approach to understanding the world when Paul is saying, and all of the scriptures are saying, like the brokenness of our world is much deeper, much more profound, and we actually have responsibility in it. And what the law does is it starts to define sin for us so that we can see it clearly as it is. And then Paul goes on to say, not only does the law define sin for us, it starts to reveal sin in us. This is what he says next, finishing verse 7 and on. He says, For I would not have known... What coveting really was, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I lived apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. So Paul is saying that not only does the law define sin for us, it also reveals sin in us, and he used coveting as an example. Now, oftentimes, when we think of coveting, we think of seeing something that someone else has, and we want it really bad. Right, Nate and I were on a Zoom call with a professor of his from Fuller Seminary earlier this week. And this guy is in his mid to late 50s. And he has this beautiful, long, flowing locks of hair. 
right? And I'm like, man. And I don't know about Nate. Nate has a haircut very similar to mine. I don't know what he was thinking on that phone call, but I found myself thinking like, what I would do for a head of hair like that. Like, just imagine how I could style that thing. I don't know what that says about my life. I don't know what that says about me, that I actually look at other guys' hair, and I'm like, man, you don't know how lucky you are, you know? This is as good as it gets for me. So sometimes we think coveting is looking at something else that someone has and wanting it for ourselves. But when you break down this word in Greek, it's the Greek word epithumia. Coveting here is the Greek word epithumia. Sometimes it gets translated as lust. And epithumia is actually two words smushed together. It's a preposition epi, which just means over and above, and the word thumia, which means desire. Put those two things together, you got epithumia, which it can translate to an over-desire, an inordinate desire. You could even say an excessive desire. Desire. Obviously, desiring something evil and immoral, we would say is not okay. But what epithumia gets at is that you can take a good thing and desire a good thing, and it can become sin. It can become a bad thing when that good thing becomes an ultimate thing in your life. And you have to have it. And if you don't have it, your life is ruined. Epithumia means you can, take, you can desire a good thing and it can become sin. So in the movie Incredibles, uh, the, the two different movies, Bob, the dad of this superhero family, has these superpowers. And at the beginning of the first movie, he is not allowed to use his superpowers because in the world where he lives, superheroes are starting to become suspicious characters, and maybe they're actually harming the city more than helping the city. And Bob has forced to go get a nine-to-five job and suppress him being a superhero, and he's wildly depressed. He hates it. And so the first movie is him trying to go back and be the superhero he wants to be. And then in the second movie, if you've ever seen the second movie, his wife is being held up as like the model superhero, and he has to be at home caring for the kids. And it makes him really angry because he's having to deal with all the kids stuff while his wife is living this superhero life. Now, in the movie, him being a superhero and desiring to be a superhero is a good thing because he wants to help people. It's like he's got these powers that can be for good, but he desires them to the point that it makes him depressed when he doesn't have that thing. It makes him angry when he doesn't have that thing. And so a good thing becomes a bad thing when it becomes an ultimate thing because you're like, my life can't be fulfilled unless I have that thing. That's an epithumia, which means there's probably a really fine line between when a desire is a good thing and a desire becomes an epithumia and becomes a bad ultimate thing. And what the law does is it defines that for us and reveals that in us. The law begins to show that sin is a real reality in our world. And sometimes we desire things, good things even at times, that become bad things because they become ultimate things. And what Paul is doing here, and what's interesting about this section, is it almost sounds like Paul is saying the law is responsible for this. The law is the thing that does this. It's the responsibility for sin in our world. Right? If you go back and read verse 8 through 10 again, it, it starts to feel that way. This is what he says. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me, every kind of covet, coveting. So something produced coveting in me. It's almost as though it got placed there. It wasn't there before. It got placed there. And it seems he's saying the law did that. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. It almost sounds like the law, he's saying, caused sin. And then he said, I found that, every, that the very commandment that was intended to bring me life actually brought death. So maybe it's the, co the, the commandment and the law that brought sin and death in the first place, which goes back to what I said at the beginning. A prohibition impacts your disposition and maybe even leads you to transgression. But notice the subject of the sentence. For you English majors, you grammarians out there, if we read verse 11, because in verse 11, you find the exact same phrase that you see in verse 8. Exact same. 
And notice the subject of that sentence. Verse 11, for what? Sin. What is the subject of the sentence? Sin. We look for subject. Here you go. Here's your grammar lesson. And I'm not the one to be really giving grammar lessons. Subject, <laughs> verb, object. So we're looking for the verb. If sin is the subject, what does sin do? He says, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment. Essentially saying what the commandment does is it gives opportunity. It creates context. It sets a situation for sin to do what sin always does. And what does it do? Sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. What does sin do? It deceives. And through the commandment, sin, not the law, but sin, put me to death. Essentially, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that sin exploits what is good to bring deception and death. Sin exploits what is good. And the law is good because it's an extension of who God is. Paul will say in verse 12, explicitly, the law is good. This is verse 12. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. And what sin does is it exploits what is good and brings deception and death. And this is exactly what Satan does at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 3, with Adam and Eve, they're put into this good world that God created. He said, you can eat of any tree here. It's a good world created for you to steward, to partner with me. But there's one tree you cannot eat from. If you eat from that tree, there will be consequences. And so they're hanging out in the garden, and the serpent comes along one day, and he's like, hey, what does he start to do? He starts to twist on God's prohibition and twist the command. Did God really say... And he starts to sow seeds of deception and doubt in Adam and Eve to cause them to doubt God's goodness. And all of a sudden, sin surfaces. And it doesn't come from the law. It comes from us. Sin is this evil force in the world destroying God's peace and shalom. And it's actually in us. So the law is exposing sin for what it is. You know, I, I said earlier that the prohibition impacts your disposition and leads you towards transgression. Maybe you could say it this way. Maybe this is the actual true statement. This is the proper way to say it. The prohibition reveals your disposition. Like sin is already in there. The law didn't put it in there. Because we live in a broken, fallen world, like sin is in us. We are born into a broken world and we all contribute to the breakdown of this world. And what the law does is it defines it for us. It reveals it in us. So the prohibition reveals the disposition and desire towards transgression. The law simply reveals. And this is how Paul finishes this section. Verse 13. Did that which is good, i.e. the law, did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it being a reference to sin, used what is good. It exploited what is good, a reference to the law, to bring about my death so that the commandment, that through the commandment, sin might be utterly sinful. So basically, Paul is saying we are in a place where we need major help. Like the law isn't going to save us. The law isn't designed to save us. So which raises the question, what do I do when I see sin surfacing in my life? Like how am I supposed to, to, to respond? Oftentimes people go to the law and they're like, I'm just going to work harder. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do more. I'm going to serve more. I'm going to like run this race to try and keep proving to myself and others that I have it within me to bring salvation about in my life. If I just follow the law. And Paul, all along the way, is saying, no, like that's not the purpose of the law. So don't go to the law for salvation because it's only going to bring death because it defines sin for you. It reveals sin in you, but it doesn't help you solve your sin problem. What does? Who does? Jesus. Jesus does. And so the response when sin is exposed in you isn't to try harder or do more. It's to simply repent. Repent. 
And repentance isn't trying to make ourselves feel bad for what we've done. Repentance is just going to God and saying, I need you. And what repentance does is it starts to shape our desires. Paul says in Romans 2, which is the other chapter in Romans where Paul is talking extensively about the law, he says, do you not know? Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience? Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you towards repentance. There's nothing to fear in owning up to your sin, allowing it to be exposed, and then turning to God. Because in his kindness, forbearance, and patience, he will deal with you with grace, mercy, compassion, and love. And as you experience that turn, it shapes desire in you. It shapes a greater love for God in you because you're like, this thing over here is not satisfying me. It's not giving me the love I hoped would. It's only leaving me disappointed, but God is continually dealing with me with grace, compassion, and love. Uh, Earlier this year, I had a friend who I was in a conversation with, and he was telling me about this ongoing lifelong battle with a certain sin that he's had for a long time. And he said he was just coming out of a season where he had recently like given himself into that sin. He just succumbed to that. He just gave himself over to it. And as he was narrating that for me, he said, you know what happened? I stopped repenting. I stopped turning to God. I stopped naming that for what it was. And then saying to myself, I know that won't do anything for me. And so I'm going to go to God because I trust that he will. And he said, After I got busted for it, I started to repent again, and I'm finding that it's reshaping my desire. It's reshaping my desire towards God, trusting that He will satisfy the longings of my heart. And so, in this place where we find ourselves being exposed, we don't have to live in fear or shame. We live in freedom because we go to God, and He deals with us graciously. I think one of the reasons why we want to and feel inclined to break prohibitions and commands when they're put in front of us is we want to live as our own master, don't we? We want to be our own king and queen and tell the world, this is, hey, I call the shots for my life. But when you have a whole community living in that way, like when you have a whole community of people who are like, I'm the king, I'm in charge here, right? It creates chaos and conflict all the time. And what repenting does is it reminds us, no, 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 I'm not the king. Jesus is the king. And so naturally, I should submit to him because he's going to be a way better king than I am. And he, in his graciousness, kindness, and forbearance, has provided a way for me to live in unity, harmony, and love with everybody And it's through the good news of Jesus, through his death on the cross, his resurrection to new life. That's the thing that defines me, not the law, not my sin, but him and him alone. And the more we submit to who he is, it increases our capacity to love and be the people that God has called us to be. So may you see that God's love is good because it's an extension of who he is. May you allow the law to do its work in your life by divining sin and revealing sin. And may it cause you to run to Christ, trusting that his grace and his grace alone will bring you the redemption that you need. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, for your graciousness and your goodness and your kindness, your forbearance and your patience in our life, Lord. We are in desperate need of you. And so, Lord, we ask this morning, as we're about to go before the Lord's table, that this simple meal would be a reminder of what you have done through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, bringing us to new life, no longer defining us by sin, death, shame, or even our inability to obey the law, but simply defining us by the grace that you extend to us. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen. So in just a moment, we're going to have ushers who are going to dismiss you row by row to uh, take communion, and we're going to invite you to come up front. All of these stations are the same. There's four stations, and the way that communion is prepared is you have two cups, 
stacked on top of each other. One cup has a piece of bread in the bottom. The other cup on top has the juice. And so as you go through the line, you can just take a stack of two cups from a sp- slot, and that will give you everything you need. There's also prepackaged um, communion elements, if that's helpful for you. We just ask that as you come up the middle aisle, you return to your seat through the side aisle, hold communion for you, and, and use this as a time to reflect. To say, what, what are the things that, that's being put in front of me? The, the prohibitions, the laws that I'm pushing against, the sin that I know is surfacing. What is the desire that's there? And just ask the Lord to reveal that to you and use this as a moment to turn to God and say, God, help me. Again, because I need you to do this in me. And then once everybody has gone through, uh, I'll come back up and lead us to take the, commun- the communion elements together. I'm going to invite the ushers at this time to